All right, welcome back to Cricket Aviation. My name is Jim Payne, and this is a completed vertical fin for a Cricri. Um, so stick around and I'll show you how it's made. Um, also, uh, remember to like and subscribe to the video so you'll get uh, updates when I post new videos. Uh, you'll get notified. Um, also, check out the, the, the description to uh, see the links for Instagram and for Facebook. Um, I post out on Instagram, but it cross posts over to Facebook so you can get uh, real time updates uh, for things I'm working on in the shop. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go build a vertical fin. Yes, I'm building the world's smallest twin engine airplane. Look at that, this is the vertical fin pieces that I cut out. The other sides have already been uh, drilled and cut off also, so that's sitting down in a slot there. So this makes it nice and easy. Holes in the correct spot for the bearings. Perfect taper. Oh, looks great. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna work on is the vertical spar that attaches to the horizontal spar. And I just wanna show you what the next step is here. So I did put a rod back through these bearings and what we're doing is these parts are the parts that I made on the CNC machine uh, previously. This is the vertical web um, that connects to frame 12. And these fittings are designed to get riveted to this spar web on either side and we're basically making the part that gets bolted to these fittings here so there's a bolt that goes through the two holes on here on either side of this this bearing now um, what I want to do is get this all squared up together at the same time that I'm setting up and drilling the holes for these uh, you know these spar caps here um, but I do have to drill or I should say ream these holes. I, I think I drilled these on the CNC to like five and a half millimeters. They need to be six millimeters. And so what I need to do is precision ream these holes to match the exact rod size here. And these all have to be straight um, going through there. There can't be any up and down with these as it goes through. There can't be any side to side. So um, I'm gonna match drill these. I'm gonna start with drilling these two ends. And what I will do is put them in my mill you know, back to back, basically like this. And I will drill through both of them at the same time. Um, what I have to be careful of is I wanna do the same thing with these, is match drill these, but if these aren't matched to these, which mount right next to each other, the bolt might not fit through if one is a little bit higher than the other. So, um, so I'm gonna have to figure out the best way to do that. I think what I'm gonna do is match drill these outside ones and then try and match drill the inside one to the outside one it's closest to. I think that'll be the easiest way to make sure that these all line up. So I'm gonna go work on that now, see if I can ream these out. Show you what I actually did here to mount these in here so they're perfectly flush on the back side, which is the most important. Um, you can see there's a little bit of separation between the two at the ends. I'm just gonna put a little uh, pair of uh, vice grips that I have and just pinch the two together to make sure that they stay, uh, stay together. But um, I should be able to uh, then ream those holes out as perfect as possible together. I just aligned the ends here and made sure that the edges of the holes are at least within uh, the tolerance for me to be able to get a reamer in there and, and ream it out. So I ran the reamer through it. So now I'll see if I can figure out how to align the inside pieces um, to make sure that they're exactly the same um, 
distance from the edge and I can I might be able to just put them in here in the same manner then at least I know where this bit is located right now is exactly the distance away from the edge um, it's just the end to end I'll have to line up which uh, might work out pretty well I think I might just try that so I was able to ream the uh, the inner pieces too and then I came back over here and slipped them all uh, onto this rod now and so you can see if I slide this bar cap you'll see these are supposed to get uh, you know pushed up flush uh, to the spar cap here on the back side um, but anyway um, if I flip this whole thing upside down you'd be able to see it better because then this would be upside down as compared to uh, to this which I'll try and do in a minute here to finish aligning all of this um, but everything seems to fit really well um, I just need to square everything up and then get to the point where I can mark these holes, but you can see I can move this side to side and that's what we're really concerned about is making sure that this whole thing is square with this when we go to rivet this all together. All right, so I'm gonna flip this over and see if I can align this a little bit better and start marking these holes. I propped this up on a shim underneath here just to raise it so that it would uh, meet up with the holes underneath here. But now you can see on the outside here, these two caps on the ends are supposed to be flush with the side of the bearing inside of there. There is supposed to be a gap between the bearing on this side and this um, this inner cap piece on either side. So there's actually an aluminum uh, washer or spacer that uh, we have to make that fits inside of there. And then there'll be a bolt that bolts this together and bolts this together. So um, I think what I'm gonna end up doing here next is on this outside cap, I'm gonna go ahead and drill the rivet holes on the outside and temporarily fasten that. And then what I'll do is I'll square this up and then I'll mark the holes for the inside, or I'm sorry, for the other side with it squared up and mark and drill those holes and get that uh, aligned properly um, 90 degrees. And then I'll go ahead and just set these in there and space those wherever they end up. Um, wherever those holes line up with a bolt through here, we'll go ahead and uh, drill those holes off. We'll get this all drilled, and then what we're gonna try and do is get to the same point we did with this, where we've got it all aladine, we've got these caps all drilled and uh, riveted on here, and glued. Um, and then what we can do is move forward with the ribs on the elevator, and then also the ribs on this uh, tail part. Um, and we'll kind of work on these together in parallel. I might as well do all the same processes at the same time. The, cutting of the uh, ribs and uh, gluing of everything and putting the skins on. We'll do all that at the same time. Edges and some squares here to make sure that this uh, vertical spar is completely square with the horizontal. And then what I did is I started drilling some holes down here on the end um, just to keep that piece, you know, vertically from moving. And then what I think I'm going to do now is actually take it apart and just drill one of the upper holes up here and um, put a temporary fastener in there and then realign it and make sure that it's still aligned properly and then I'll go ahead and drill the rest of the holes on this side. With the outside caps now drilled and temporarily held in place, I simply am just gonna put a rod through here. I put these inner ones in and I'll just line those up in parallel with the ones next to it and we'll just final drill all of the last remaining holes for these inside ones and uh, once that is done I believe we're at a point now where we can uh, go ahead and glue all this together I glued these caps onto this web um, I didn't use the method that we used on the uh, the horizontal uh, tail or the elevator um, which you know we screwed down between a couple boards and part of the reason for that was is that I final drilled all these holes to the actual rivet size in order to make sure that I could align um, the ends here properly with uh, the pin and the bearings and all of that. So what I did is I just epoxied these onto the web and I used uh, the temporary sheet metal fasteners to just hold it in place. And then what I'm gonna do is just before the uh, epoxy hardens, um, I'll take those uh, sheet metal fasteners out one at a time and just clean them because otherwise I'll end up with uh, those being epoxy. Finished the gluing process and sat overnight. I pulled all the temporary sheet metal fasteners out of it. And next thing we're gonna do is we're just going to uh, get this all cleaned up um, and prepped for uh, Aladine. And I just dropped that uh, vertical spar into the uh, Aladine bath. So 
a couple minutes from now it should be done I can pull it back out and we should be able to rivet I did notice and you can probably see through here I'm gonna have some uh, fun trying to get those three rivets that are in between those two angles uh, I think I'm gonna have to get creative with a punch and a hammer to set the back side of those rivets there um, since this is all glued together, but we'll figure it out. All right, this should be done uh, in a couple minutes. Far out of the Aladine bath and just dried it off real quick. So pretty much ready to start um, riveting this. What we're not going to do is rivet any of the holes from below here. So these holes here that I haven't even final drilled out um, from here down are going to be what we attach this to. Uh, frame 12 with so we're not going to rivet these we're just going to rivet everything up and around here we'll get that all riveted all right so i just finished riveting the uh horizontal tail spar that came out really well i uh, used the same technique that i did with the elevator in that i just mounted my uh, rivet set into my table and then just riveted it backwards so i just put the rivets in you know, head head sticking up with the tail here, and then just used my uh, rivet gun with a flat rivet set to uh, to pound the backside. I had a lot better control over that than trying to do it in reverse and using a bucking bar on the back because there just isn't a lot of room and space here. Um, and then for these these ones that were kind of hidden in between these two angles here, uh, I did just use a uh, you know a punch, put some tape on it to protect it, and it took about four or five pounds with a hammer. Um, again, just like this with it on the rivet set, and I was able to pound those in uh, in perfectly well. So that worked out, uh, yeah, that worked out great. So now that this is done, um, I'm going to take the foam and uh, cut out the ribs. All right, I just finished cutting out the uh, vertical tail ribs. Um, you can see I've got the... The, the tabs in here that I just have to snip off, this is actually upside down right now. I cut it uh, I cut it on this side so you can see the tabs down in there. Um, so I'm just going to snip those off. We'll pull these ribs out. And we're going to start on gluing the, uh, the vertical fin ribs. Um, you can actually see up here, I, I cut out just a few minutes ago a... Uh, form a form that I'm going to use to assemble this part uh, this was basically copied from uh, Sh Shannon's uh, post on uh, homebuiltairplanes.com it's very similar anyway so um, these ribs will actually fit down in here and the spar web here will actually fit right on top of there and we'll be able to get everything aligned really easy using that so I'm gonna get these ribs all cut out I'm getting pretty close to being ready to start gluing the ribs on the vertical fin. Um, so what I did is I had cut this frame out the other day that I showed you. Um, I went ahead and slipped all of the ribs in place here. And I did notch the tops of these ribs so it fits around this uh, spar. On my form, I did drill a hole in the spot where the, um, the six millimeter fittings are supposed to align. And what that allowed me to do is make sure that from this fixed rib position that I have the spar positioned, you know, across this plane uh, properly so that this first rib's in the right place and then they all line up as long as I have this rod going through the hole here at the end. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to go ahead and glue the, the bottom ribs first. I'll take these top ribs off. None of this is, is attached. I just set everything here to make sure everything was fitting properly um, and aligning properly. Uh, what I do have to be careful though is on all of these lower ribs when they're fit into this comb, I don't have any rods going through here that make sure that all of these ribs are perfectly centered on this comb. And that's a big concern. Uh, obviously, if, if I put the spar in here, these um, top ribs will actually align with the spar because I've notched them out basically to fit. But on the bottom here, I gotta make sure that these are not tilted a little bit where a rib is kicked out on one side or not on the other. So I am going back around with a ruler 
and making sure that all of the ends of the ribs are perfectly flush and that I don't have anything, any, any of them sticking out. Um, because obviously if I were to glue some of these in here, they could be tilted a little bit, the glue then could harden, and then these ribs would not align with the fault spar that's going to attach to the, to the back here. Um, and then we'd have an issue with the skin fitting properly. So I'm going to make sure that I double check the alignment on those before I actually glue everything and let it dry. But, um, and this isn't a rib here. This is just a spacer I stuck in because that has to align with, uh, this lower rib here so that I can add these, uh, you know, spacers in, in, in between these on top. These actually just fall right out. And what I'll end up doing is when I go ahead and, uh, get the top ready, I'll, I'll rubber band these in place, strap them down so that it leaves a gap, proper gap, so that when I slide this uh, assembly down in here, the ribs will align and go ahead and, you know, glue to the right spot. That way I won't have any misalignment. Um, another thing let's talk about here is this little rod that's going through the top here. So the manual recommends, I think you use a three millimeter diameter piece of balsa wood. Uh, to use as an alignment piece that gets glued in there permanently and part of the reason that gets glued in there is as the skin is wrapped around the top here because of the angle this is at the ribs are going to want to push away from the skin and slide one direction because it's not being the force isn't being straight down it's kind of at an angle so part of the reason that they want you to put this in here and glue this in here permanently is to just add a little bit of rigidity to the end of the ribs so they don't uh, move too much when the skin is being put on there i couldn't find three millimeter balsa i ended up just going to the uh, craft store and just getting uh i'm assuming it's pine or something like that uh, um, let me see if it says what this is maybe poplar um, but it's it's light enough i'm not too worried about it like i said i couldn't get balsa wood i did actually look on the internet to see if i could get a piece of um carbon fiber rod just to just to glue in there just to keep wood out of the airplane i guess um, but this isn't really used for anything it's really not any support even after uh the airplane's done it's really just support for when the skin is being glued on so i'm not too concerned about it i am going to just wipe some epoxy around the outside of it just to seal it um, and then we'll make sure that we get, uh, you know, glue beads on the either side here. I think what I'll do is I'll slide it down. I'll put a little bit of glue on the rod and then I'll slide it back in. And then I'll go back and just make sure that there's enough glue on that to just hold this all in place. At least for the next uh, few steps until after we get this, the skin glued on. Um, but yeah, this is moving along pretty good. Like I said, I'm going to prepare these ribs now we'll get glue on those ribs we'll get this uh, strapped down and in place and so i finished gluing the lower uh vertical tail uh ribs in place yesterday i let that sit overnight um so they're completely dry i did check the edges on my ribs are perfect i got perfect alignment everything came out really well and let me see if you can see underneath here um you know you can see the nice bead of glue that I got around each one of the bases of the ribs. That's really how you want these to come out. You want the glue to kind of squeeze out the end of those ribs. Um, so anyway, very happy with that. What I'm moving on to now is I'm going to glue the front ribs in place. And I'm gonna use some of the techniques I used on the, uh, the horizontal tail where I'm gonna actually just strap these into place to create the spacing for each one of these top ribs. And then I'm just putting these balsa strips on the ends of each one of these ribs to make sure that, again, the edges are perfectly aligned between the rear ribs and the front ribs. So that's what I'm preparing right now.
I got all the glue applied here. Um, I actually put uh, these sticks underneath here at the top because these rubber bands were starting to dig into the foam a little bit that I wrapped around to try and keep some pressure down on it. But uh, otherwise this looks pretty good. Glue is squeezing out in the corners down there pretty well. Probably got a little bit more glue than I needed to on these, but uh, it looks good. At least it's not running anywhere. And I think I've got a pretty good profile all the way down. Making sure everything is nice and straight. That these uh, ribs vertically are aligned. I did have to put a couple shims in between uh, some of my pieces down here in the end. They started to stack a little bit uh, too close together um, as, as I moved down. And I think it's just the difference between you know, my CNC machine cutting these slots versus cutting these, you know, perfectly. Just making sure that these align and then I obviously measured from the end here to this first rib here to make sure I had the perfect spacing that I need at, at this end. So. Otherwise they all look uh, aligned perfectly uh, set. So we're just gonna let this dry overnight and we'll come out tomorrow and it should be done. So the glue's all dried on all the ribs that we installed here the other day. Um, before I remove this from the fixture, however, I still need to glue in this uh, dowel that's holding these nose ribs in place. Um, so while I've got this all in this jig and everything spaced evenly as far as the rib spacing goes, what I'm going to do is just get mix some epoxy up and just put a bead on each side of the ribs here on the front side and then I'm going to twist this in a little bit to just move that bead into about the center of the ribs. And I'll probably go back then and put a bead on the back side of each rib and then just coat this stick with epoxy, just trying to seal the wood. Applied some epoxy on these, uh, this wooden dowel here and just got a nice bead on each side. I just put this on its end and flipped it upside down, did one side, flipped it over and got the other side and just got a nice bead on there. So we're gonna let this dry and I'm gonna start working on some uh, metal ribs. So I finished cutting out the uh, rib um, pieces for the top of the vertical tail. Um, I also cut out the forms that I'm going to use to shape these. Now, I didn't really, I didn't really pay much attention when I cut these out to um, to where the flanges were that needed to be bent on either end of these. Um, I'm really concerned about with these forms is shaping the curve on either side. I'm going to go stick these in my uh, bending brake to bend these straight edges on the top and the bottom for these lips. I could have, if I cut these out, actually made these, you know, fit. This one actually did make it, but I didn't, you know, I'm not cutting the end of this to bend this up to a certain angle or degree. So I'm just going to bend the sides, get those shaped correctly, and then I'll go back and bend these lips uh, on my bending brake. So, um, I have to do some preparation to these. Uh, we have to round the edge where we're gonna bend it over so that we can radius this material properly um, around there. So I'm just gonna sand a little lip or a little uh, radius around this side. Um, and then I also need to mark where I'm gonna flute this. Uh, and the only thing you have to pay attention of when you're doing the fluting process is where you're going to have uh, rivets or screws located in that flange so you got to make sure you put your flutes in between there so I'm gonna do some measurements look at the plans and figure out exactly where I need to flute this um, and I believe there needs to be probably two here because I think there's three rivets that go on here and I actually think there's five along here or maybe there's five rivets and four I'll, I'll have to take a look but uh, I'm gonna go and shape these and get these prepped and then I'll show you what they look like before uh, before we actually do the bending Next thing I'm going to do is just sand in the uh, fluted areas uh, on the side here. I'm just using a quarter inch uh, rasp and I'll just uh, do these at an angle. You just want to make sure you don't actually get all the way to the edge here where you want to have a nice even uh, um, even crisp edge. You want to you want to angle this so that you're you know down about a half or more uh, of the uh, the file and taper that up to zero about a I don't know maybe a sixteenth of an inch or even an eighth of an inch away from that edge. So I'm going to do that right now and do both sides of this. When you're done, uh, the only other thing I'm going to do is go back with a, some sandpaper and just knock down these edges here because you don't want a sharp edge between where it goes from the flat down into the flute. So we're just going to round off all of these edges on the inside here 
and then we should be ready to put this together and uh, see if we can round that corner. All right, hopefully you can see how easy this process is. Um, so I sanded out these flutes and just rounded them off. And the first thing we're going to do is just bend over these. Just bend this over with a hammer. And you want to kind of have the stroke kind of follow through a little bit so that you get it down to the base. Now, I can keep pounding and pounding this and this isn't going to get any straighter. It's just going to keep moving these ridges around. So um, you're better off just at this point just starting at one end and work your way down. And I use a, a punch. I think this is maybe a quarter inch, might be slightly less, but I just use that to set in here in these little flute spots at an angle and just hit it with the side of the hammer. So just, again, give a little dent there. And what that's gonna do is pulls this material down so that I can keep working my way down here to the next one. Give that one a hit, keep going down here. Give this one a hit, and we'll keep working our way down. That one a hit, go all the way down the end here. Give that a hit. Yeah, got a little bit of a tool mark there, but then what we want to do is just go back down. And depending on how tight it is, you can actually come back and hit it again. I have a little dent there because I hit the, caught it with the side of the hammer. That's all right. Okay, I'm gonna flip it over and do the other side, and then usually what I'll do is I'll pop it out and actually bend it in a little bit more by hand, put it back into here, and then hit the flutes one more time just to tighten it up. But. Uh, back to the other side here. So we ended up with a pretty good shape here. Um, now one of the things you can do is to prevent some of the, sp the spring back um, issues is you can taper this edge here, you know, actually take a, uh, a, a you know, sander and actually angle this a little bit more so that you can compress this in a little bit more and let it spring back to 90. But 20 thousandths is so easy to manipulate by hand that it's really not a problem to just squeeze it in with your fingers. Um, but like I said, sometimes what I will do is take this out of the form. And you can see that's, that's pretty well, shaped pretty well. Um, and then what you can do is, is you can just, you know, literally just bend these in with your fingers a little bit more if you need a little bit more angle. Um, if it starts to bow this way, um, and, and is no longer flat, what you can do is pop it back into the form here after you've bent them in a little bit <clears throat> and just hit the flutes one more time uh, just to tighten it back up a little bit. And, uh, but anyway, that looks, that looks pretty good. I got almost 90 at the other end here. This is where it was a little bit shy of 90, but, uh, but yeah, that looks good. 
All right, I went over to the bending machine and just bent this <clears throat> lip up to, I think it's 29.7 degrees and bent this other one down from 90, the same amount, that 27 or 29.7 degrees in the back here. So bent those two and then I, I was able to pop this out of the, uh, the comb that I had it in and uh, this weighs absolutely nothing. It's virtually weightless. Um, but anyway, this rib is going to fit at the top of this here. Um, and it's basically uh, centered on these ribs here. Um, it's supposed to be, I think, 18.4 millimeters down from the center line of the, uh, um, the bolting uh, area here for the for the uh, horizontal stabilizer or the elevator um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna position this in here we do have to notch out the bottom of this around the heads of the rivets that's actually shown in the plans uh, I could have actually set up those rivet heads uh, and and notch them out when I cut out the part in the CNC in fact I will probably go back and add that into my drawing um, but yeah, we're just trying to set up this rib. It's got to be perfectly centered here. Um, we'll go ahead and get these holes drilled here. And then we've got to position this on the nose, um, which I believe gets glued into place. Um, and then the aft rib um, basically goes from here out. Um, we've got to bend the same or similar angles on the other side here too. But uh, I'm going to try and get these positioned and get these installed and clecoed into place on top here. So. So I finished bending both of the uh, front and rear uh, ribs for the top of the vertical fin. Um, and you know, these end up getting installed. This one goes in the front and this one mounts to the back of the spar, similar to this. And it basically creates the top of the uh, tail assembly. Um, but the thing I wanna bend next is this is the fault spar that goes along the back side of the the fin here um, it has to be bent on four sides um, with specific angles on there but uh, this is what attaches to the back side of this fin here so i want to get this fit into place and probably get this uh, glued in place before i finalize the these top pieces here um, so i'm going to go ahead and see if i can bend that um, and then we'll see how it fits. So I just finished bending the, uh, the fault spar. It actually turned out uh, really well. Um, so that uh, ends up going somewhere here along the back. I've got to find out exactly where this has to align, but this does get glued to these ribs here. So I might prepare that and um, alodyne this and get this glued in place because once I do that, I can then start to uh, fitting these ribs into their final position and get those holes drilled. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna figure out exactly where this goes, get this piece prepped, and we'll go ahead and glue that false spar in. Um, as I, as I was trying to mention before, and the battery went dead um, on my camera, but uh, this is longer than 24 inches, so you will not be able to bend this on a 24 inch brake. I did have to use my big bending brake to do the longer edges. Um, and then I went ahead and put it in the small bending brake, uh, you know, with the, the fingers in it to do the, uh, to do the ends. So just be aware, you can use a form. So if you wanted to cut out a block of uh, MDF in the correct shape and, you know, go ahead and, you know, put this around it and, and you know, bend it in the shape, you, you could do that. Um, it's obviously easier if you can use a bending brake, so. Minor problem I ran into here, trying to get these ribs fit in the top here. Um, the end of this rib is supposed to actually fit all the way down in here and butt up against this rear rib all the way down in the corner. Um, but I got a really significant bead of epoxy down there in the corner and I'm gonna have to remove some of that in order to get this rib located all the way down in there where it should be so it's not hitting this, uh, you know, hitting this radius on the end. Um, so if you're gluing these rear ribs, if you have the ability to wipe the glue off on the top rib, um, top side of the top rib and clean that up a little bit more before that epoxy dries, that will help you out when you get to this stage where you're ready to, uh, 
position to drill the holes for these uh, top aluminum ribs. So just wanted to let you know, little tip. I uh, was able to get rid of uh, the bump there of glue by just using the, uh, you know, a, a Dremel tool and a small metal grinding bit. I was able to just round off the edge of that so that I can fit the, uh, the radius of that rib down in here. And what I decided to do is not worry too much about positioning this ribs and the ribs across the top, you know, exactly measured down from this hole because I can only go down to where the inside radius of this hits the rib. I, I can't do anything else. Um, and it's it looks like it's, you know, right there anyway. So I'm just grinding this out enough to get that, that radius in there. I'm putting this down as far as I can and then just marking the holes. Um, let's see if I can flip, flip this over. I'm afraid I'm going to break one of these ribs off. Um, and you can see I, I marked one of the holes by just clamping that down in there in place. And what you really want to watch when you're uh, installing that is that you have a perfect edge distance from the outside ends of those fittings to the end of that rib and that that end of that metal rib is flush with all of these uh, rear foam ribs on either side so that you get that position right in the center where it needs to be. So. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and drill these holes and then see if I can get this front one positioned across from those exact same holes since once I drill these through, I should be able to line these holes up that are already drilled into this piece. So uh, we'll see what it looks like when it's pinned together. All right, I finished drilling out these ribs and uh, putting temporary sheet metal fasteners in there to hold them in. I did end up with a, a little bit of a problem. I, I don't think it's gonna be a problem in the end, but these ribs are probably about a millimeter higher than they should be. In other words, if I measure from the center of this hole, the bottom of this flange here is supposed to be 12 millimeters from the center of this hole. I'm about 11. Um, and uh, I just couldn't get this one any lower without, you know, starting to dig into that lower rib here where the glue issue was. And I, I don't think this is gonna be a problem. Everything seems to be perfectly aligned all the way around this anyway. Um, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and glue the fault spar into place. I did pin that at the top too, and just all these angles, everything is is aligned really well. But I'm gonna alodyne this, glue this into place, and I'm not gonna move forward with doing anything else with these top ribs until I get the skin bent and can put the skin over the entire thing and just double check the alignment with the top here, alignment with the bottom, and make sure that I'm not off by you know these being you know, slightly higher. I mean, I might have a little bit of a lip here that sticks out above the skin. I can literally just sand that down. Obviously, I gotta check the alignment of where my um, rivet holes are gonna be across here and how that all relates to the strapping piece that has to go on the outside of here. But again, it, it's off a little bit. I wish I could have gotten this these both a little bit lower, um, but like I said, it doesn't, uh, I mean, everything's still aligned very well. Um, I'm just not thinking at, at this point that it's going to be an issue. If it is an issue, what I will have to do is I would have to remake these two ribs because I've already drilled these holes down here and actually just move those holes on the flange to, you know, put it down some more. And I would have to obviously go back in there and actually start, you know, digging out the, the, the you know, on the foam side of that rib underneath here to just recess it a little bit more. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure how all this was supposed to work because this rib is actually in the right place. So if you look at the drawings, this rib or this this um, uh, this metal rib here actually does look like it's supposed to almost push into this rib a little bit. Uh, and you know, I, I probably would have paid more attention to the exact placement of this. Uh, when I put it in or make sure that I didn't get any glue in there or even moved it down just a tiny bit just to make clearance for this because there just isn't enough clearance um, between this glued rib and uh, this metal one here. Um, the other thing I could have done is I could have, before I glued these ribs in place, actually placed these ribs in here. Um, it would have been, I mean, it would have been a lot more difficult to glue these in, so I don't know that I would have done that anyway. But uh, again, just something to pay attention to if you're, you know, working on a, the tailpiece like this. I completed the uh, alodyne process on the fault spar in the back there. So 
I've just uh, prepped that to be glued onto here. I'm using the same technique that I used with the ribs where I'm just putting in these balsa spacers or balsa strips with uh, rubber bands wrapped around the ribs. And what that'll do is when I slide the uh, fault spar in here, it will keep it uh, perfectly centered at the ends of the ribs. And then I'll just run some rubber bands across the, uh, the main spar and just wrap it down the center so that it stays tight against there. And we'll just let that dry. I'll probably put some uh, temporary sheet metal fasteners in the top here just to hold it. And really the only critical measurement for installing that fault spar is the measurement from the end of the spar to the center of this rib, um, which becomes critical with how the skin's gonna fit down here on the bottom and how this is gonna mate up with the, uh, the rear fuselage when we you know insert this into frame 12. So uh, it's really that measurement. Uh, this measurement up here, it, it just works out wherever that one ends up anyway, and it's got to match up with the top of this rib and everything's got to be square. But uh, there's a measurement here from the top of the, um, the top of the fault spar to this rib, and there's a measurement from the bottom of the fault spar to this one, but this is really the most important one. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, apply some glue on this and get it all strapped down and I'll let it sit overnight. And then uh, I should be able to start fitting the skin tomorrow. Fault spar glued in and it's just held in here with the rubber bands. I just have it strapped down to the center spar. I don't know, I, I'm gonna let it sit overnight, you know, upright and flat on something just to make sure that it stays, you know, as straight as possible, though I don't expect that it's gonna move at all with it uh, being already glued to all the front ribs and the, the rear ribs. But yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, the other thing we have to do before we put the skin on is I do have to fill in between each one of these ribs with about a millimeter thick piece of um, the rib material that needs to get glued down on top of the uh, spar here. Um, that needs to be done and sanded you know, to the profile here because these ribs actually stick out just a little bit and you're not supposed to glue the skin directly to the, uh, uh, the spar itself. You're supposed to have a thin layer of the, uh, of the uh, foam in between. But uh, yeah, we'll let this sit overnight and uh, we should have that glued in. And like I said, the only thing I did is I I taped on either side down here to mark where that spar, or I'm sorry, where that rib should be on the spar just to make sure that it was, it was aligned properly and that I've got these straight. And then I did go back and measure between each one of these to make sure that these ribs were, you know, as straight as possible. Yeah, it's, uh, this, this part as far as gluing this and the ribs, you know, they're already held in there in place by the uh, center spar. So let's we'll let this dry and we'll come back tomorrow and we'll see if we can uh, start fitting the skin on here. So this is the skin for the vertical tail um, that I cut out just a few minutes ago on the CNC machine. Um, what I'm trying to do right now is start the forming process where you know, we, we get this into an airfoil shape that will fit around the, uh, the vertical tail. Now, all I did so far is I took this side here and bent this over just to the point where I could get these two edges, bottom edges, touching. Um, if, you, if you follow what happens in the manual, what you're supposed to do is get the two halves together and clamp it down on one side. And then using a guide block on the other side you're supposed to put like a flat piece of plywood over this and actually press it down onto a guide that's on the other side that's on the basically the nose side that's set to a specific thickness so that when you bend it down uh, that it will actually stop at a specific radius for the upper part of the rudder or I'm sorry, the upper part of the vertical fin and the lower part of the vertical fin, which actually are not the same ra radius. Um, so another builder had mentioned to me that what worked for him was to do a uh, 20 millimeter high uh, block on this side, tapered down to 14.7 at the, the bottom. The bottom actually has a tighter radius than the top does. Um, so. I'm trying to just get to the point where I can at least get this folded over and get the two halves pulled together because until you get to that point, you aren't going to be able to put a board over the top of it and fold it. Um, and what I'm having to do is just gently make sure that I have these two sides perfectly aligned and just keep putting a little bit of pressure 
all the way along the front of it to just get it to start to bend as you can see here it's just starting to get a little bit of curve to it once i can get the other side down i'll be able to just clamp it down and then i should be able to put the guide across the front and flatten it um, I've never done this before, so this is going to be interesting to, to see. Now, the reason I did the blue tape here, I'm going to do blue tape on this side, and I'm going to do blue tape on the top side here. And the reason I put that there is I'm going to put a clamping board on top of here, and I want to know how much skin is actually underneath that board so that I make sure I keep the two sides exactly uh, parallel with each other when it's tucked under the board that's going to hold this down. Um, if there's any mismatch between the two sides, you're going to fold it and it's not going to be straight. So, All right, I was able to get the uh, skin folded. Now, I didn't do anything high-tech here to do this at all. Um, I literally just put some shims and stop underneath one corner and some shims and a stop uh, at the other corner so that when I push the board down it just hit those two uh, endpoints. I didn't do a tapered piece. I didn't do anything like that um, and just put pressure across the board. Now the board that I was using um, was stiff enough that it wasn't flexing in the middle while I was pushing down on this. So uh, if you were using a smaller you know, half inch piece of plywood or something you'd probably want to have a tapered piece all the way down, but I was using a double thickness of MDF that I had from an old tabletop that uh, didn't basically flex at all. This actually fits, uh, you know, pretty well in there. I probably could go a tiny bit more here if I wanted to on the smaller side. Uh, the top side here, let's see if I can see this. This side actually looks really, really good. So. I'm actually really impressed with how well that works. So anyway, um, yeah, I think that worked pretty well. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that for a first try. It wasn't actually as hard. The hardest part is initially getting this thing flat enough to be able to pull the two, uh, the two sides together. Uh, that seems to be the most difficult part is just to be able to get these two ends to come together so that you can push it down enough to, to get a good uh, radius. So yeah, this looks good. I might uh, mess with this end a little bit more just to flatten it. It's really, really close, but there is a tiny gap at the, well, I don't know, it's really close. There's a little bit of a gap there. I might just give it one more, one more squish. But All right, we're starting to make some real progress on the vertical tail here. I popped off all the rubber bands that I had on here and took this out. I have the, uh, the fault spar now glued onto the back. Um, we got the skin bent here for the vertical fin. Uh, this is a sheet metal that goes over the top of that uh, framework there. Now, I'm doing something a little bit different than what the plans tell you to do for bending this flange. Because what we have to do is bend a 90 degree flange across the bottom of this uh, tail skin because that is what needs to sit on top of the aft fuselage and then there's rivets that get put along this flange once it's bent uh, at 90 degrees. Now the plans want you to just bend this flange with these pieces completely flat. So you're just supposed to put some boards, flat boards across there and bend it over on each side. Problem is, is then you will lose basically from this nose part back the curve and you'll have to then try to stretch uh, this flange once it's bent to try and re-achieve the curve, uh, curved shape of the vertical fin. I did not want to do this in a two-step process. Number one, I tried to take a piece that I had already bent at 90 degrees and I tried to hammer on the edge of it, which is what you're supposed to do to try and get it to stretch on the outside edge and just, you know, create a curve. Number one, I couldn't really get it to bend much. And number two, I just put dents all over the flange. And so I was really concerned about using that method for this and ending up with this flange being bent, but it being kind of dinged up, dented up, you know, smashed up. Um, and so I, I just didn't feel comfortable doing that. But because it's not too difficult to, um, you know, take the shape of the bottom of the vertical fin, which is actually in the plans um, as part of the rivet holes that need to get drilled onto the rear fuselage, I just basically took that drawing and created a template that fit inside of the, the, the tailpiece here. And then what I did is I just used the, the, the leftover pieces from cutting this, which were on the outside of the MDF piece that I cut, and 
trimmed some off the end here and got those to fit around and then clamped it on there. And right now I'm just trying to determine if this was gonna work because what I wanna do is bend this and shape this all at once. In other words, if I get this framework here set up and clamped in well enough, I should be able to take a hammer and just like we did with the ribs, um, just stretch and bend this flange all the way over. And that's what I'm planning on doing. Like I, I was just using this as a test. I'm gonna have to create some thicker pieces on the outside of here that's gonna be a little bit stronger because these aren't gonna hold up to me pounding on them. Um, but I just wanted to see if this was gonna fit well enough and actually work. So I'm gonna cut new outside pieces here that'll be thicker. What'll be good about using a thicker piece is I wanna have it just long enough where I can put it on the edge of my bench. Um, so that I can set this hanging off the edge of the bench with the MDF piece on top so that when I start pounding this sideways and pounding it down that um, I have a surface that prevents this from slipping uh, slipping down the skin but if I have this hanging out the bottom and basically that flange is being held on top and then I have this on top of the edge of a bench I think I'll be able to shape that just fine so that's what I'm gonna work on next. I'm gonna try and get that shaped um, so that uh, I can then complete the test fit on there um, on the framework there. But the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get that rear fuselage back out and I'm going to put this uh, framework temporarily in the rear fuselage where it's supposed to go and put the skin on it temporarily just to make sure that everything's aligning, everything's fitting right, that my rivet holes here are gonna match up with the rivet holes that are already drilled into the, uh, into the rear fuselage. Um, and what I'll end up doing is putting some tape on in a different spot so that I can line up the outside edge of this with where it should meet up based on the edge distance of the existing uh, rivet holes. So that's what we're going to work on now. I, once I get this fit into the rear fuselage, this fit on here to make sure that everything's aligning properly, then I will go ahead and finish this up, get, all, get the skin all glued on. We'll finish all the top ribs up here and the, there's a bunch of little, you know, some more brackets and washers and things that we have to make. Uh, we still have to flange this uh, hole here. Um, so there's a lot of finishing stuff that needs to be done, but I just want to get this preliminary fit work done to make sure I'm uh, not making any mistakes. So, all right, I'm gonna see if I can bend this flange. And I just created an inside form. I created two outside forms that I just cut on the ends uh, just so I could clamp it uh, all together. And then I have this part here clamped on the end of my bench. So my goal is to pound this flange over here, stretch it into shape and, and pound it down into shape. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm hoping none of this slips. I've got it clamped in here pretty hard, but uh, one of my worries is that I'm going to start pounding on this and things are going to start moving and it's not going to stay in, in proper position. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll stay. And then what I'll do is I'll flip it around and I'll do the other side. So I'm going to do one side at a time while it's uh, solid here and attached on that side to the bench. So work really, really well. Uh, you just have to go really slow. I was able to bend a lot of it over with my fingers um, before I started pounding on it just to limit the amount of... Uh, you know, possible dents I put in it, but uh, it uh, it actually looks really good. I might just uh, go over it with a board and just tap it a little bit more just to make sure that it's got a good solid radius here on the bottom, but uh, that looks great. I'm gonna try and do the other side. You know, you see the reflection on it. There's a few ripples still in there. I'll have to go back and just do a little bit of cleanup on that, but I have a nice shape and there's a good radius there which is the most important part because the rest of it I can touch up and fix and just straighten out a little bit more on the outer edge um, but yeah I'm actually quite happy with how that turned out I think that was much easier and there's less damage to it than what it would have been had I tried to pound on that lip and stretch it so uh, you know it, uh, it it seems like that was the uh, definitely the better way to go Okay, I'm gonna do some fitting now. Make sure that this fits on here and it lines up with the trailing edge of the false spar properly. I'm gonna get this actually set inside of the rear fuselage with this uh, skin on top and just make sure again, everything is kind of fitting the way it should be before I move forward any, any further. Uh, you know, you can see the, the, the fit here. Super, super good. And if we go around to the top here, you can kind of see where these ribs start aligning up here. I've got a nice tight fit. I mean, this is perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm actually amazed at the construction of this aircraft. It, there's nothing on here that I am working on that I'm thinking, oh geez, this is 
40 year old technology or you know this this airplane was designed 50 years ago the plans have been out since i think 1982 uh was the last revision uh you know it's 40 years old and this you know aluminum composite type of uh construction is is amazingly light i, I cannot believe how lightweight this is um but uh anyway yeah this is all coming out perfect this uh this is obviously going to connect to the um, the fault spar is going to rest on top of the rear fuselage. This flange has to rest on the rear, rear fuselage. This has to fit into that frame 12. And that's kind of what I just want to test fit right now. I just want to get this thing set into the rear fuselage just to see how the angles are working out, how that's fitting with the, uh, uh, the uh, frame 12 that's in there, and uh, just seeing how flat and nice this looks. I also want to check the angle of this and the radius of this to see how this matches up with the holes that I've already drilled in the rear skin for those uh, rivets. So I'm going to pull, pull that out right now and get this fit in there and we'll just see what it looks like real quick. Um, so I've got the spar inserted in the right spot. Um, I actually looked down here in this, uh, this rear um, fault spar back here absolutely fits perfect it's right on the exact line where it should be so um, the skin fits down nice and nice and nice and tight with everything fit down in there yeah and you can see there's probably a little bit of gap this probably needs to come up just a little bit but uh, because nothing's permanently attached in there everything's kind of just floating a little bit but this is very satisfying. So what I'm gonna do right now is I am gonna put some tape on top of, I should have done this before I put the tail on here, but I'm gonna put some tape across here um, next to my uh, holes that are in here that need to be drilled for the skin. And I'm just gonna take a pencil or a pen and just draw a line on the outside of those uh, pieces of tape just to see right now if I pull that skin tight, how close I am, if there's anything that's really off or if I'm you know, within, uh, easy margin of error that would be fixed by just getting this all glued together and tightened up and everything so and I punched holes where they were already drilled into the rear fuselage and you can see I've got that six millimeter uh, edge distance exact on on both sides of these so uh, yeah this this is working out perfect the only place it got off a little bit here and that was expected because the skin wasn't pulled completely tight against that rear um, uh, the rear fault spar that it has to be glued and uh, air final glued to so I was expecting these to flare out a little bit That's fine. I was really trying to see where the end of these were um, But yeah, this is uh, This is perfect. It's all it's all fitting exactly like it should so so I'm working on the uh, The other fittings that have to go up here on the top of the vertical fin. I did cut out and bend these supports that have to go basically about here. I don't know if you can see that from here. Um, but they go right here and we have to drill a six millimeter hole to match up with these uh, these holes for the vertical, uh, or I'm sorry, for the horizontal tail um, where the bearings go through. So there's one of these on each side. Yeah, one goes right here. So I have to final drill these holes out I just drilled a 16th inch hole just to see how it aligned up with the center there and I'll drill these out and then I will ream them out to six millimeters um, but I had a really hard time bending these um, I tried bending these again on my small bending brake and they cracked I adjusted my bending brake out as much as I could so that I could increase the radius in here and they still cracked um, so the only way I was able to bend these was to put them in the vise like I did with the uh, um, some of those uh, parts on the rear fuselage at the tail section. Um, these are 40 thousandths so they're you know thicker than just a normal sheet metal like this um, but I was able to put them in there and just bend this again over a radius and it worked you know quite well. I've got a not too big a radius you know looks pretty good um, they're nice and 90 degrees, they're nice and flat, so I think, uh, I think that'll work just fine. Now, I could have tried that annealing process that I mentioned before. I could have heated, you know, heat these up. Um, I, again, I just didn't want to mess with it if I didn't have to, and it was just a matter of getting the radius uh, to a point where they wouldn't crack. And where they would tend to crack is, is down here in, the, in this, this tail area. It got a little bit tight. I even moved these a little bit. Uh, further away, so I created a slightly bigger flange 
um, just to try and prevent that crack from happening. Uh, but anyway, I have them bent, so I'm gonna try and position these in there and get the holes drilled and get the, uh, the rivet holes, mounting holes, uh, drilled in there. So we'll do these. And then there's a couple of, you know, washer type things that we have to actually glue on the top here. I think there's a 20 thousandths uh, round um, 16 millimeter washer we have to put on either side there. And it's to get this out to the same flush um, area as these ribs are gonna meet up. The other thing I did already is I took a straight edge on here and checked every single one of these flat spots on these ribs um, to just straighten them out to make sure that everything's perfectly flush. I actually don't have this end attached yet, but I, I have verified that these are all flush. It has to be curved in a little bit more uh, tighter on the inside just because of how the compound curve here works. So um, I've done that. Uh, I've got good, uh, you know, spacing here as far as the, the ribs sitting off of the top of the fin here or top of the, uh, the brackets here. But that's where we're going to put that washer. And uh, I'm just going to finish up some more of this and I'll show you what it looks like when I get it, the rest of it pinned together and these holes created. All right, I thought I'd just show you some of the uh, adjustments and fitting that I've actually had to do to get these uh, angles to fit in here properly. So um, this has to fit all the way up to the top here where there's this inside radius that was on this angle when it was cut. And if you don't actually file the ends of this off and kind of radius the corner to fit, um, you really can't get this up in here as far as you really need it to go. Um, if I were to try and avoid that radius with the end, I would actually be down another, you know, one and a half millimeters or so, which actually gets the center hole a little bit too close um, to the, uh, you know, the edge distance on this side. So I did take half of this and radius the corner so that it would get around that, uh, that radius inside corner there. Um, but uh, yeah, and I just wanted to show you that before I actually pin these in place and final drill the holes, so. show a couple other details that I finished here. Um, so I put in, there's a, a washer on either side. I don't know if you can see it there, the little shiny 0.5 millimeter washer. There's one on this side and I put one on this side. That fills the gap that's between the skin and these, uh, um, these spar caps. Um, it's basically taking up the, the thickness of the, uh, the ribs, you know, that hang out the sides of the, uh, um, the spar caps there. Uh, so I, I just cut those out on the CNC machine and then uh, reamed them out. Uh, the other thing that I did, I made this rudder bracket uh, that mounts in here. It's eighth inch thick, as you can see. So it's a pretty thick piece. And I just bent it here. It's gotta be bent one more time down and then the little, it's gotta be bent back up again on the end um, for where it attaches to the rudder. But what I wanted to do is get this in place here so that I can get the two, or actually the three, um, rivet nuts that need to be attached to this and drilled into this before I alodyne it. So, um, so I got that, th these little things done here. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna do is get these rivet nuts put in here and get this drilled out so that these bolts, three bolts that have to go in here fit. Um, the other thing I did too is I did flange this hole here. I used the same technique that I used on the, uh, the horizontal where I just cut out of MDF uh, a, a form that was three millimeters larger than the hole and created a plug that fit into that and just um, shaped the bottom of it at a 45 degree angle and pounded this uh, into shape. So, um, but yeah, that looks, uh, looks good. I'm starting to get some of the last little things finished before I need to uh, alodyne these. And that's really what I'm trying to do is get everything done so that I can alodyne these two parts, um, these two metal ribs, and then get them put into place uh, permanently so that when we start gluing the skin, those are, uh, those are completely done. 
here. I went ahead and pop riveted these brackets into place. That's how they were supposed to be attached. Um, so I went ahead and did that. Um, I'm now gonna glue the front of this rib to the um, foam rib behind it. Uh, and I'll pin this with the uh, temporary sheet metal fasteners until that dries. And what I'll do is I'll just leave this overnight. Once that is dry, I'll feel comfortable taking the skin back off and finishing the, uh, the few things that need to be done inside. Um, and while I, glue, while I glue this onto the front here, I'm also gonna glue those washers. So I'm just finishing up on a few of the things before, um, before I glue the, uh, the skin onto the vertical fin. Um, so the, one of the things I did is I, I glued these little tiny shims basically or filler pieces of foam that need to go on top of the spar. And the reason for that is, is that these ribs actually stick out uh, on either side of the spar about a millimeter. So we're just gluing a little piece in there that will go back and just sand down smooth so we, that we get a nice transition from the front rib to the back rib. Um, and I did that to all the ribs. I just used some blue tape just to hold them on there so I could do both sides at, uh, at once. So we're letting those dry. The other thing I did is I added these foam pieces in here on either side of I think it's rib eight and rib five. Um, and that's just so that when the control rod goes through the holes here that it provides some dampening side to side to prevent vibration in there. So I just went to the store and just picked up some rubber foam uh, weather seal and just epoxied it onto those ribs. Uh, just to give you a little view of what that looks like down the center you can see got just that little black edge coming out of each side to just dampen the control rod so um, so once these few things dry and I get these uh, these shaved down on the side I'm basically ready to um, put the skin on and glue it which I'm planning on doing tomorrow I'm getting the nut plates today to finish the rear rib that needs those nut plates installed so that I can final rivet this together. And that's really the only thing I had left to finish um, other than what I've shown you here that has to be done before we uh, glue the skin on. So I'm just finishing up on the ribs here on the top of the uh, vertical fin. Um, I did put the nut plate in here at the top for the uh, um, the rudder uh, bracket that goes in here that uh, we cut out the other day. Um, I still have to do a nut plate here and a nut plate here. I flip this one upside down. Uh, obviously it has to be installed underneath here, but I'm trying to locate where I need to drill the uh, um, the rivet holes to hold that nut plate in. So I just attached it on the bottom uh, with a bolt and some washers and um, I'm just going to drill through the tops of these so that I know where the uh, uh, the rivets need to go for this one and this one and then I'll get these installed also. Um, we should also talk about the bolts that are supposed to be used in these locations. Um, I think the plans call for a four millimeter diameter bolt. Um, but of course we're trying to do everything in aircraft quality hardware which is in, you know imperial and not metric. So the equivalent of a a, a four millimeter diameter bolt is going to be approximately um, 5 30 seconds or a number eight screw uh, or number eight bolt. The problem with a lot of the hardware for aircraft is that bolts typically go down to an ANN uh, dash three and a dash three is three sixteenths bolt which is equivalent to a number 10 screw. So when you need to get smaller than a number 10 or smaller than 3 16 um, you actually in aircraft hardware tend to change over from a bolt head to a screw head. Um, and that becomes a little bit problematic with a lot of the Cree Cree stuff which has a lot of small hardware where you'd like to still have a bolt head um, on a smaller diameter uh, bolt or screw. So one of the solutions to that, so this is an NAS 1801 aircraft screw that actually has a bolt style head on it. It also still has a Phillips head screw in the center. But this is a very good alternative to what we otherwise wouldn't be able to find is a bolt that is a number eight with a bolt head on it. But the NAS 1801-08, that means this is a number eight screw basically, can be purchased with a 
um, you know, hex head for, uh, you know, using a socket or a, or a wrench on. Um, so I'm going to be using these in a lot of different places where these number eight bolts are uh, required. Um, so one of those is obviously these three spots. So this here, this here, and this here, and that's going to hold this, uh, you know, rudder attachment bracket that mounts up here. And the, the pin that goes in the back here is where actually the rudder attaches. So I'm going to be using uh, these NAS 1801 bolts or screws, I should say, uh, in these three locations. And there's a few other places too where I'm going to be using these. Um, any place there's a number eight, I'm going to try and use these uh, NAS1801. So. so I did a couple things in preparation uh, before uh, gluing the skin onto the uh, vertical fin here. Um, I did alodyne the, the, this um, panel. And what I did is I just created a box out of some that scrap foam material that I had. I laid plastic inside of it and basically filled it with five gallons of the alodyne uh, diluted with the water and was able to push this down and actually submerge it in there for you know three minutes so that I could get a nice coat of alodyne on here. It's still a little bit wet so you can see some of the shiny spots is where it's still wet. Um, but my plan is to just clean this really well before I bond it to the, uh, to the ribs over here. So the other thing that you'll see is that I did finish sanding these filled areas that are in between these ribs. And you can actually just take a razor blade along the surface of this and just cut it off and then just sand it down lightly. But there's uh, basically about a millimeter left uh, on top of these ribs. And of course, we're going to glue all the way to this structure all the way around and then across the, uh, the framework back there. So I'm going to put this together in the frame. Um, and go through a test process of, of seeing how this is going to actually pull down when the gluing process occurs. So I'm going to kind of do a trial run here and I'll show you what that looks like. All right, so I just did a quick um, vacuum uh, bagging test here on this uh, vertical fin. Um, it looks like it's working pretty well. I, um, I just wrapped it in plastic. I was able to get the vacuum cleaner connected to it and I used uh, Mr. Colin Bond's method of filling a uh, plastic tube full of uh, wine and actually inserting that into the bag here and just measuring the height difference between the two sides as the vacuum pulls the, uh, the wine up into the tube. I, it seemed to work pretty well. Um, so I, uh, I'm just gonna continue on here and actually go to the final gluing process and um, the glue I have or epoxy I have seems to dry in about you know, four hours max. So um, I don't know how long I actually need to keep it on here. There's been, uh, I think a manual might say something like 12 hours, which would be you know, overnight for me, but um, I haven't glued it yet. Um, but before I took it all back apart, I thought I'd just show you the few things that I did that you can see now a little bit better. Um, so I used the fitting that mounts back here and I just mounted it here and it uh, of course is the right angle to almost stick up exactly vertical. But the purpose of that is is that when I go to put this skin on here after I've put the glue on the ribs, I wanted something to be able to butt it up against so I knew that I was in the correct spot to just drop it down and that I wasn't going to be sliding it back and forth. So by putting that in there, I'll be able to just stick the skin over right above that area and just slide it down and I should be able to set it right on there and then strap it down and the glue then won't, or the skin won't move on the glue um, after that. So, and I'll just leave that on there while it's uh, drying. So um, that should make it then so that I can align this pin through the skin and get that alignment correct um, before I actually vacuum bag the the skin on um so the other thing i did do is there's a board on each side um, that i put some screw holes in and that is to just pull the skin down here tight so that the uh, fault spar that's in the back that the skin will pull up against it um i did that on both sides so what i'm going to do now is just take the whole thing apart i'm going to clean the skin on the inside uh before it's glued on and uh then i'm going to go ahead and put the glue on the ribs put the skin back on and then we'll put the plastic back on it and I will start vacuum bagging this while it's drying. Now, I, I purchased a variable controller for my little um, shop vac that I have here. Uh, this I just got off of uh, Amazon for you know $17, I think. 
I'm not very happy with this. And the reason I'm not very happy with it is it does have a variable setting and it's got a knob that adjusts. But if I have it all the way at its lowest setting, it still runs this shop vac faster than I would like to have it run. Um, I have to leave it all the way down at the bottom to have the shop vac run. And then there has to be a little bit of a vent uh, of air to suck through here so that I don't create too much suction. So uh, again, I, I don't know, maybe this would work better with some other shop vacs that I have here. I'm not really sure. Uh, this is the one that I was wanting to use it with because this is the smallest one I have. Um, but it, it'll, it'll work. I just had hoped it would uh, actually go down to an even slower speed and that I could actually use the dial on that, um, you know, that variable resistor to control the actual power on the shop back. But the fact is I just have to set it as low to setting and, and, you know, use other methods of controlling it by letting a little bit more air into the, into the bag here. But, um, yeah, this looks like it's going to work good. I'm going to go ahead and get this all prepped for glue. I'll
about one foot where it should be. A vacuum. I let this run overnight. I just turned the vacuum off uh, just when I walked into the shop this morning. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and take all the plastic off of this and, and uh, take this out of the frame here and see what it looks like. The one thing I did after I uh, vacuum bagged this last night is that um, I went ahead and put these Clecos in through the plastic. I was a little bit concerned about this rib inside of here being glued tight against the skin. So I just popped some uh, sheet metal flat fasteners in there just to make sure that uh, it stayed in the right place. But um, yeah, it looks good. I think the only thing I'm concerned a little bit about is how it connected to the, uh, or got glued to the, um, the fault spar in the back and I'm hoping I don't have too many runs. Uh, it's something that you really can't deal with until after it's dry because you just can't get those two sides put together and then get in there to clean it up while it's drying. So. Uh, we'll just have to check that out and see what it looks like. Um, but yeah, let me get this out of the plastic. Right, I got the fin removed from the plastic and uh, taken out of the framework that I had it in. I had definitely had some problems here. Number one mistake I made is I should have put um, plastic over the top of this framework here because of course when I glued the, or I'm sorry, when I put the fault spar on top of this and strapped it down, glue came out the bottom of the fault spar and it glued itself to my wooden frame, as you can see here. So I had a bit of a trouble, a bit of a problem getting it off. I had to actually use a, a scrap piece of metal that I had and slide it underneath the rear skin to pop it off of the frame here. However, what I did, of course, is I delaminated it in spots along the fault spar. Now I could probably go back and just re-glue that. It's not that critical of a thing. The other thing I did notice, and I don't know if it's visible here in the camera, but I've got a tiny little, not a, uh, almost like a dent, um, at each spot where the rib crossed over the, the spar. So I think the vacuum bagging process actually compressed the skin onto the foam ribs and contracted them a little bit, but obviously where it pops over the spar, it's not able to compress it there at all because of course behind it is, is the metal spar. So I ended up with just, just a tiny little mark there. It's just, you know, if you get the light right, you can kind of see it. Um, but uh, anyway, that's a little bit disappointing too. I, I'm not sure that I could avoid that. Um, you know, maybe if I made sure that, I mean, I did make sure that those were sanded down really well. Uh, but again, I think there's just not any compression along those and with it compressing the rest of it. Um, and, uh, you know, that may have been what caused that a little bit. But yeah, I've got a little bit of fixing up that I have to do on this, unfortunately. I was hoping I'd just pop this out and be ready to go, but um, I'm gonna have to, uh, I have to definitely re-glue re the false spar in the back and just clamp it together just to make sure that I get a good uh, glue joint there and then we'll go ahead and put the security rivets in. So I'm going to work on fixing a few of these things. Thinking about this vertical fin a little bit more and this, you know, debonding that happened here on the trailing edge. I'm not really upset about it at all because it's actually fairly easy to fix. Um, I am wondering though, if I were to do this again, would probably use the similar method that is used on the horizontal stabilizer and the, um, the rudder itself, where you do a two-step bonding process. Um, if I were to do this again, I think what I would do is apply the epoxy to all of the ribs like I did and put it in the form, I'd clamp everything down, we'd vacuum bag it exactly like we did, but not actually apply any glue to the rear um, fault spar. And then as a second step, take it out just like I did here, and then put glue into the gap there at the trailing edge, and then clamp that together as a separate process after the ribs and the skin has dried on there. And part of the reason for that is once you put glue on this fault spar, um, 
and apply the skin to it, uh, you don't have any way of ever getting back here to the trailing edge of this again while it's drying to clean up the glue, to check your joint, to make sure that you have, you know, that you've clamped it properly. Um, when I look at how much glue ended up on this piece of wood here, it almost looks like the glue ran out of the um, fault spar or where it was applied to the fault spar. You know, in certain places it didn't on this, this other side here. You know, on the top side it did glue there on the end and it did glue down there on the end. Um, but, you know, either I didn't have those clamping boards clamped tight enough and there was still a gap there. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure, but like I said, because you can't get to this area to, to look at it while it's drying, you have no way of knowing what's going on here. And I could have ended up with big runs that, that were on the skin here, which I wouldn't have wanted either. So I think doing this in, in a two-step process might actually be the better way. And like I said, if I was doing this again, I think that's how I might do this. Um, so now how am I gonna fix this? So this isn't that big a deal. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run blue tape all the way along the outside of here from the edge of the false bar uh, to the end of the skin because I wanna protect the allodyne surface there as much as possible. Um, because what I need to do is I have to get sandpaper in between this uh, lip on the fault spar, which is about 12 millimeters, and the skin itself, and just run it back and forth. Because what we have to do here is we have to reestablish a mechanical secondary joint to the glue that might still be in between these two surfaces. Um, because the glue is dry, we don't get a chemical bond between the new epoxy that we're adding to it and the epoxy that's in there. So using sandpaper and using cleaning methods, we have to make sure that we get at least a, a uh, mechanical bond like we originally had between the two skins of aluminum that were being glued together. Uh, but what will be really nice here is once I clean it up and get the sandpaper in there and clean it up, and of course I only want to make sure I go the distance of the fault spar. I don't want to scratch up the skin on the inside, so I'm going to have to be very careful and I'm going to yeah, actually put sandpaper in there with tape around the edge so there's a mark so I know exactly how far to go in to, to clean this out. Of course, i got to make sure I vacuum it well and, uh, and uh, you know put some acetone on there just to clean it up before we glue it again. But once I glue it again, I'll be able to clamp it on the ends here. I'll be able to clean up all of the glue marks and glue lines on there um, before before it dries, which will be nice also. Now the good thing is, is everything on the top side here seems to have uh, glued really well as far as the metal ribs up there. Um, so it's just a matter of getting those uh, um, doublers that go on the outside of here and getting the pop rivets in there, which we'll work on as soon as this, uh, this rear trailing edge is dry. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this fixed. Um, I noticed these uh, these little dents that are in here are actually slowly going away. So I'm almost wondering if the skin being compressed while it was in the vacuum is now starting to relax a little bit and the foam ribs are starting to, you know, take a little bit of shape back. Maybe they got compressed a little bit during the drying process, but I have a feeling though over time those are going to actually disappear. They already are getting much less than they were. So. Um, but yeah, it might indicate that I had a little bit too much vacuum on there. I did do a little bit more than the, the 12 inches of uh, variation in the, the, uh, the tube that was filled with wine. So it could be that's the case. I squeezed it a little bit too hard. I was trying to make sure that I got a really good uh, you know, bond between everything. But um, anyway, I'm going to clean this up and get this fixed and get this re-glued. All right, as you can see, I was able to re-glue this... Uh fault spar on the vertical fin. It looks pretty good. Oh, one of the, the things I did is I used a, a tie strap to put glue on the end of it to kind of get down into each one of the uh, rib locations where, you know, there might have been some separation here at the very trailing edge. Um, so I just made sure that at each rib I went and put, uh, you know, a fair amount of glue down in there so that I made sure that the ends of the ribs were, were good and glued and uh, yeah, I was able to get the rest of the glue on here, so hopefully we'll let this dry for at least 24 hours before I pull these clamps off to make sure that it uh, sets really good. The uh, I, the gluing was finished on the uh, rear part of this. I just took all the clamps off. Um, yeah, I'm actually very pleased with how 
this turned out and this was much easier to glue afterwards um you can see i've got a pretty decent bead of glue on there Let's see if i can get the reflection right but yeah this looks really good I'm, I'm very happy with this and like i said i'm not so sure i wouldn't do this in a two-step process just like this if i did this a second time uh, the thing that we have to do to finish this up is we need to get those straps riveted in here on either side i'm going to work on that that next uh, those parts need to be kind of tapered on the edge and i need to put some uh, countersunk uh, holes in those for eighth inch countersunk pop rivets that go in here um, the other thing that we're going to do here is along the the back side of 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 each um, edge of the rear fault spar is we're going to put in uh, five safety rivets and basically what they are is just very small three thirty seconds rivets that are evenly spaced you know one on the top one on the bottom three in the middle um, just to provide a little bit extra support for that glued edge along there and if it were to you know at some point debond for some reason uh, those rivets are there to keep the skin attached to the fault spar uh, you know so that there isn't any catastrophic failure of anything here um, but I feel like at least with now that I've re-glued this you know I, I, I'm totally confident now that I've got a really good glue joint all the way along here so yeah everything's looking great we're getting very close to uh to finishing this thing up rivets on the skin over here and they look pretty good um the only issue i had down here at this one on the end here i don't know if you can see it with the lighting here um the pop rivet that went through here on the end um, didn't give me enough room to be able to get the rivet tool in here to squeeze this one So I actually drilled and popped it out. It, it came out really easily So I'm going to do that to the other end here I'll take this pop rivet out so that I can squeeze the solid rivet here on the corner um, And then I'll just reinstall the pop rivet. It's not that big a deal So that was the easiest fix The other thing I did is I just put tape down here where my tool was going to hit because when you squeeze this It's a little bit of an angle so your tool wants to kind of scrape up the uh fault spar and scrape off some of the uh, alodyne that's on there. So I'm going to get the other side done here, get these rivets in here, then we'll be done. Um, we're now going to start working on these straps that go across the top or these doublers that go across the top here. I was hesitant to trim the skin off here down to the top of this doubler until I got a chance to fit the actual vertical or horizontal fin on here so that I could check the the angle and see where it was going to hit along here um, and determine if I was even going to remake these straps that I did um, I, I realized afterwards after I already started working on the skin and everything on this that I, I probably didn't need to wait um, because I actually have the horizontal um, stabilizer almost ready to be skinned and I realized I could take these pieces here over to the horizontal fin with a pin going through the fittings and bearings on there and then turn this to see where it hit the ribs instead of waiting till all of this is done. Um, so I'm just going to take you into the other room where I have the horizontal fin sitting on the floor and I'll just show you how this all is going to fit together. But I put a rod here through the fittings that are going to attach to the vertical fin. And then what I did is I just slipped this on the end here and just brought it up to a rib here just to check and see. And what we're looking for is we're checking for that gap of, you know, once this is skinned and this the, the, the horizontal fin is going up and down, you know, where this is going to hit, how much of a gap do we have in between there, and are we getting full travel out of this before you know it hits the rib? And on the back side too, I don't know if you can see that. You can see where it'll hit back there. Um, so it, I'm very happy right now with the, the curve that I have from where the pin goes in to where it hits. And that's really what I was concerned about because the rest of this, I mean, it's gotta be this wide. This isn't gonna change. It's really only from this, this tip down here uh, and the curve along there until where it gets down to that minimum i think it's you know 12 millimeters wide or something so this looks really good i'm happy with these so at least i know i can put these in and then i can trim the skin i down. go ahead and document the mistake i just made i just ruined this part right here uh, anyway i tested out on a scrap piece that i had and tried to get the countersink set correctly which i did worked perfectly but then the first hole i tried to do which was this one uh, the countersunk tool 
only rested on one side because of the small radius around the outside and it tipped outward and made the Ray, or made the recess much deeper than it should have been. So I gotta now make a new part, which I didn't wanna do. Uh, but that's what happens, and I make these mistakes all the time. Uh, every part that I've made for this airplane, I think I've made three of them. Because <laughs> uh, even these, I cut these out initially wrong because the hole spacing wasn't where it should have been in uh, alignment with the ribs, so. Uh, again, uh, it's a good thing I have a CNC machine. I should be able to just go cut it out fairly quickly, but I do have to set some things up to do that. Um, but I'm gonna go cut another one and drill and see if I can fix my mistake here quickly. And so I cut out another one here. I overlaid this one on top and made sure that I drilled the eighth inch holes in exactly the same spot because they were all your final drilled to the eighth inch side on, size on the, uh, on the vertical fin. So now I'm gonna go back to trying to countersink these again. Um, I did round the edge on the back here and I rounded the edge around the bottom just to clean these up make them a little more aerodynamic um, So I've got both done and I'm ready to just pop rivet them on um, We're using uh, countersunk uh, pop, pop rivets on these the the manual doesn't indicate That I glue these on it doesn't say I I don't I, I can't glue them on it just doesn't indicate I have to the problem with not gluing these on is um, isn't a structural thing. However, I don't have any way to easily corrosion treat the back side of this unless I just half alodyned it. Maybe I could tape off the other side, put it in alodyne and alodyne the back side. But I don't have any easy way of doing anything to the skin behind this to treat it for corrosion. And this is a prime place where you could get moisture, water, or something that could wick behind these two pieces of metal, and that's where you end up with corrosion problems in aircraft. So by gluing these down, I can seal the back sides of both of these straps that go on here, and that's what I'm gonna do, uh, just so that I can provide some corrosion protection. Maybe it'll add a little bit of structural integrity to it. Uh, it doesn't, not really the intent, and it doesn't really matter. Um, but that'll definitely make it so that I don't have to worry about corrosion behind these two or between these two pieces of aluminum. So I'm going to mix up some glue. I'm going to put some glue behind here and then I'll go ahead and pop this in place while the glue is still uh, wet. And uh, we'll clean it up around it and then just leave it overnight. All right. Well, I finished trimming this edge all the way around here. Came around the top. It's all nice and smooth. And I am calling this now done. Um, so I'm gonna go do some uh, fit testing again with the rear fuselage with this and I may even attach the horizontal stabilizer to the top here just to see how everything is squaring up as far as being level between the horizontal stabilizer and the front part of the uh, rear fuselage. So I'm gonna do some testing and some playing around but this is done. We're gonna continue on next and finish the rudder and uh, yeah, so I'm gonna get to work. Just check and see what the weight of this vertical fin was. Uh, so if you look at it, I got it on the scale here. It's uh, 2 pounds, 13.4 ounces. That's how much that entire thing weighs.